I'd like to introduce our first fireside chat, fireside chat of the day. This session on equitable access to medicine features Dr. Julie Gerberding of Merck in conversation with Temi Jiwa Tubusun of LifeBank. As Chief Patient Officer and Executive Vice President of Population Health and Sustainability at Merck, Dr. Julie Gerberding is responsible for patient engagement, corporate social responsibility, ESG, and other functions. Dr. Gerberding joined Merck in 2010 as president of vaccines and was instrumental in increasing access to the company's vaccines to people around the world. Previously, Julie was director of the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where she led the agency through SARS and over 40 emergency responses to public health crises. Emi Jiwa Tubusun is the founder and CEO of LifeBank, a technology company that powers hospitals and care centers to deliver quality healthcare to patients in emerging markets. Since 2016, the company has distributed more than 52,000 products to more than 30,000 patients in nearly 1,200 hospitals in Africa. Hemi was a Global Health Corps Fellow and has over 10 years of health management experience with the Department for International Development, or DFID, the World Health Organization, UNDP, and the Lagos State Government. There is an opportunity for audience Q&A at the end of the session, so please submit your questions throughout this discussion. Femi, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Across the world, one in four people lack access to essential medicine. When people die needlessly, the economy suffers as well. According to the World Health Statistics report, the income level of a country has a direct correlation with life expectancy, and it's predicted that low and middle income countries collectively could lose 11 trillion in GDP each year by the end of this decade. A child born today in a low income country can expect to live 18 years less than a child born in a developed country. But developed countries are not exempt. Often disparities in healthcare lead to poor outcomes for the most vulnerable members of developed countries. An example of this phenomenon is the maternal health uh, situation in the United States. Black and American Indian women are two to three times more likely to die than white women, even when you control for education and income. Of course, these are averages, but these facts play out in actual human lives across our communities globally. COVID-19 has made this inequity more apparent, both within countries and between regions of the world. Over to you, Julie. Why not? And you know, I'd like to jump in with a question for you because you have this unique experience of really understanding the realities in countries that are in the process of developing, but also countries that are much more advanced in their development. I'd love to really understand a little bit about how you got um, so committed to, to what you're doing in LifeBank and you know, how that kind of connects your world together. Herlia, uh, Julie, thank you for that question. Um, I mentioned the reality of poor outcomes for African-American women and Native Indian women in the United States. Uh, uh, this is where I grew up and was, of course, educated. Uh, but my second home in Africa, the facts are even more horrific. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, 556 women die of maternal death daily. And I take this very personal. And by the way, most of these deaths could be prevented. So this is sort of like the fact that has driven my work at LifeBank. Um, we've been able to build over the years a platform driven by our technology and agile distribution to ensure supplies like blood and uterotonics reach the very last mile. Uh, we recently launched, and we're very excited about um, our launch in Medjugorje, Bono State. Um, for those of you who don't know Nigeria well, that's the home to the Chiba girls. Uh, and we're able to, once and for all, reach the last mile, right? Um, we operate in Kenya and Ethiopia, and those businesses also allow us to do this important work in East Africa. At the height of the COVID pandemic, we were able to scale our oxygen distribution business. Uh, we saw significant supply gaps across these countries, and that pushed us to start uh, even producing medical oxygen, 
with the launch of our very first oxygen plant. Um, and we were able to build a platform that's able to predict demand uh, and match that prediction to the supply that's available in the country. Much of this work uh, is powered by Mark for Mothers, who backed our innovation as part of the MOMS initiative. Uh, we're also working to innovate around vaccine distribution to reach the last mile. So these are sort of like that, you know, these are the you know, uh, inspiration behind the work we do, uh, being able to reach patients where they are. Now, Julie, given your experience at Merck as Chief Patient Officer uh, and previously leading the vaccines division, what do you see as a role of the private sector in advancing equitable health outcomes for all? Well, this is a perfect time to ask that question because I think we're watching the proof points unfold in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, the private sector is fostering somewhere between 800 and 900 different products through various stages of clinical development around the world that are relevant to the pandemic. And of course, they're doing that as part of a broad ecosystem that includes academia, civil society, governments, and small and large biopharmaceutical companies, as well as a number of other uh, key players in the health space. So the private sector is, in a sense, leading the charge for countermeasure development and, in many cases, deployment. But I think it's just it's a case study because what is it that makes the private sector relevant? You know, when you have a wicked problem as big as a pandemic or a wicked problem like maternal mortality on a global basis, you need multi-sector engagement, but you need some of the unique capabilities of the private sector, and that includes capacity, particularly with large companies. We have enormous reach with people in the case of Merck and MSD deployed all over the world, um, but we have the capacity of the wise crowd of experts of diverse backgrounds and skill sets that can come together and really bring their focus and shine their bright ideas into the solution set for some of these challenging problems. But we also have um, something that's in short supply these days, and that is leadership credibility. I think we've all read the statistics about the trust that has gone missing in the context of the pandemic. In, in many cases, the business leaders, the employer, the CEO are among the most trusted people in the community. And the reason for that is in part because they have built up that credibility of influence over a long arc of time. I certainly speak to, for the former Merck CEO, Mr. Ken Frazier, and we're watching that baton be passed on to our new CEO, Mr. Rob Davis, who have the spirit of walking their talk on social justice and health equity. And when you're led by people who have your core values, it's not a stretch of the imagination to be able to have confidence and trust in their leadership. And that applies inside the company to motivate employees, but it also applies to the external environment. And I think that credibility extends into some of the areas where uh, companies can have a significant impact on decision makers. We have a lot of influence just by nature of the work that we do, but we have the ability to convene other shareholders with similar values and outlooks. And we certainly have the ability to advocate and to really stand strong on the principles and values that we believe in. It makes us a better company, of course, but more importantly, it allows us to create the context for, in the case of biopharmaceutical space, better health and better well-being, but I think more broadly um, for enhancement of the communities in which we all live and operate. Julie, that's so interesting, and we're just so proud to see the work you do at work. Um, Julie, I'm curious, what role does patient voice play in helping Merck understand on-the-ground challenges and in informing product development and access. How does the chief patient officer help make sure patients have a seat at the table? You know, it's, it's interesting because of course, those of us in the healthcare sector, whether we're private or public, you know, we know in our hearts that patients and the health and well-being of people in their communities is, is our purpose. 
So patients are a purpose. And yet you have to make a conscious effort to remember that that is your purpose when you're making your day-to-day business decisions or kind of handling the nuts and bolts of a business. So I think as we've really stepped back away and thought a lot about what makes a company great, what really enhances the relevance and the impact of the world that you're operating in, it's very clear that if we begin and end with our patients, we're going to be much better situated to have the kind of health impact we're striving for, but we'll also be more likely to succeed because we will have benefited from the insights of the people who matter most in the decisions about our our solutions, our medicines and our vaccines in the case of Merck. Yeah, you know, so what the chief patient officer really um, represents, I think, is not an office that has a certain set of functions, but rather a demonstration that there is a senior leadership commitment to making sure end to end, inside, outside, that the patient is uh, the most important thing that drives our overall decision making. And we do that really in for us in four main buckets. One is by nature of the fact that we make important medicines and vaccines, they need to be affordable and accessible. So really putting that as the main frame of what we're doing in the space. But in addition, finding new ways to really benefit from patient insights way at the beginning of our process in deciding what kinds of products are needed most, what solutions make the most sense, where, how, when do patients need and want to uh, take the benefit of these medicines, involving them in the design and conduct of the clinical trials so that we have the representative people included in our clinical research that reflect the population of people we ultimately hope to help and really benefiting from those insights at end to end, every stage, whether it's packaging or delivery or uh, health literacy in in helping people understand their disease and awareness about what they can do to help improve their overall health status. The third bucket, I said, affordable access to medicine, second bucket sort of insights. The third bucket is really the patient's experience. How do patients, their caregivers, or people in the communities we hope to serve, how do they really experience Merck? Um, Do they find us easy to get answers from? Do they find information when and where they want it? Do we provide them with tools and translations, transparency that really help them have confidence and trust? But also, do we serve as an appropriate resource for for their needs? And then finally, of course, is patient advocacy. If you step back away from it, if you're looking for alignment around policy and advocacy, who is really more aligned than the patient communities who have important unmet medical needs that are waiting for new solutions to solve their specific medical challenges and the biopharmaceutical industry, which is working diligently, scientifically and beyond to try to find those solutions and bring them to market. We want the same thing, better medicines, faster and more affordably. And so that alignment really helps bring um, bring us to the full closure. I am I am inspired, Julie, and um, that idea of affordability and accessibility and patient experience is absolutely essential. As you said in the past, this work is not just about expanding access to medicine; it's about improving uptake too. Uh, but no single company or industry can meaningfully move the needle on this alone. Uh, Julie, you have worked across sectors, and you know firsthand the power of collaboration. Uh, You mentioned the importance of uh, partnerships earlier uh, in our conversation. Uh, Tell us how partnerships can help amplify business efforts and build the systems, infrastructure, and trust needed uh, to improve the health and well-being of all individuals um, and communities around the world. You know, the kinds of problems that we have to solve, whether they're important on medical needs like Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases or rare diseases that are genetic in origin. These are really hard problems. And you're right, no company is going to be able to provide the solution to any of these issues. But really no sector 
is able to provide the answers to these issues because they're usually not just about medicines. They're about social determinants of health. They're about trust in the communities where people live and make decisions that influence their health and their willingness to participate in their health care. And so by nature of the fact that we have these very complex problems, we have to bring the wise crowd together to put all of the solutions set together. And that does take collaboration. Collaboration and partnerships are hard. They're messy. There's a lot of transaction costs to getting to know people and understand what they're looking for and what they need and want and how that lines up with what you're looking for and what you need and want. So it takes a great deal of transactional effort, relationship building, trust in evolution um, to really create an effective partnership. But once you have that partnership, you know, sort of the plan horizontally execute vertically model. Once you have that partnership software worked out, you can really soar. And we're seeing that in COVID. Once we kind of got warp speed figured out on the fly, once we got COVAX kind of pulled together, we began to see that decisions could be made. CEPI is another case in point. I was on the board of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, when it was first conceived right after the tragic Ebola outbreaks in Western Africa. And at first, it just seemed like such a complex partnership, so many players with so many agendas. But as we worked through that and really got the organization settled, the governance determined, and then the resources become becoming more available, look at what CEPI's done in the context of the COVID pandemic and look where it's aiming to go from here to really make sure that we have platform countermeasures for whatever the next infectious disease outbreak is. So these kinds of partnerships are worth investing in. Um, they, they, they don't come easy, but when you get the software uh, orchestrated, you really can have a much better solution set and you can have a much bigger scale and go further faster in solving some of these wicked problems. Of course, none of our wicked problems are solved yet. We still have climate change and we're still in the middle of a pandemic, but the progress we've made would absolutely not have been possible without private public partnerships. Julie, what an enlightening conversation we've had. I'm so glad to be one of the collaborators in the work Mark does uh, to change the world. Uh, audience, before we wrap up, Julie and I would like our audience to give us uh, the opportunity to ask uh, two to three questions. Um, I hope that's all right by you, Julie. Yes, absolutely. Well, here's a question for Julie. Uh, Merck does a great job understanding the needs of the people they're serving worldwide. Uh, that's not easy. What's your advice for others in your industry on understanding the needs of patients and potential patients uh, across the globe? Um, how can others do that effectively and efficiently? You know, one of the hardest things, um, it might be harder the bigger your company and the longer it has been in business, but um, one of the hardest things is to listen. Um, when you're in a very scientific organization that's filled with incredibly smart and passionate people, um, they do have a lot of answers and know-how and experience. But at the end of the day, the people who know best are the people that we are here to serve and spending the time to truly listen, not just do a one hour conversation, but to really get out to the front line to sit down quietly, really try to understand the patient experience or the caregiver experience or the health provider experience for that matter at the front line. And once you really can get into that space, you start understanding that for most people, it isn't about the pill or the vaccine. It's really about the surround sound that allows them to have confidence that they can manage their health, um, the convenience and the affordability. And it isn't just how much does the pill cost, it's how much does the bus fare and to the doctor cost, how much does the childcare cost, all of the other things that have to be aligned in order for people to really take advantage of what we're trying to do. And the more we can see the big picture by really 
experiencing what our patients are experiencing, the better we are to avoid making stupid mistakes <laughs> that create things that work well from our standpoint, but really don't meet the patient's needs. But more importantly, I think we can co-create some pretty clever and interesting solutions like health tech and convenient places to receive care, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, we're at a very exciting frontier of better health because we have um, the opportunity to learn from the experiences that people have had during the pandemic to really stare these health inequities in the face and get to the bottom of them. But then together with the communities that have been left out, learn how we can do better going forward. Wow, inspiring. Um, so I have another question. Uh, what is your opinion on waiving patents on COVID-19 medications? Um, I think this is from someone from Doctors Without Borders. Uh, they see that monopolies are often an obstacle between people and the life-saving health tools they need. Uh, patents and other exclusivities limit supply and keep prices high. Well, you know, th this is a complicated issue because obviously, broadly speaking, in the industry, patents are our lifeblood. If we can't protect our intellectual property, we really have no value. And that's that does not encourage investors to put the money at risk that's necessary for us to do what we do. But having said that, I think this is not a black or white situation. I'm really, I'm proud of Merck um, providing our, our antiviral medicine for COVID to uh, several Indian generic manufacturers, one of whom announced today that they were um, producing the drug um, so that they can provide not only for India, but for more than 100 other resource uh, challenge countries. But in addition, by giving um, the intellectual access to our property, IP for uh, Molnupiravir to the medicines patent pool, we're assuring that uh, generic companies in other environments would also be able to take advantage of that intellectual property. This is a pandemic. And to me, that seems like the right and reasonable thing to do. And I think we're you know, hoping that the drug will be as helpful as some of our early experience suggests that it is. And we have more to learn and more studies underway that may define that more clearly. But you know, it, it's one piece of the pie. And yet that balance is challenging and we can have lots of debates about where that balance needs to lie. But I think um, this was one example where it just didn't seem to take a lot of concentrated conversation inside of Merck to know what the right thing to do really was. Great, uh, amazing. Uh, so one more question, Julie. Um, what have you learned during uh, the COVID pandemic that surprised you? What insights will you leverage and apply when confronting other health challenges? And I think this question is for the two of us, but Julie, please go ahead. Well, I'm gonna not probably answer the question the way someone might be hoping I would answer it, but I would say that I think for all of us who are really watching what's happened in basically the last two years, humility, because at every point, pronouncements have been made about, you know, the shape of the pandemic, how it will go, how it won't go, what's working, what's not working, how effective the vaccines will be, how effective they're not. We have seen the science unfold in very surprising ways. Just these past few days, we've learned that somewhere around 80% of the white-tailed deer in Iowa are carrying the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, how is that? And what does that mean for the endemic um, nature of the, this virus and its ongoing evolution and the emergence of new variants? We need to maintain a spirit of humility and a commitment to learn and adapt as we go. One of the problems and I think mistakes that we've made is by making strong pronouncements in black and white terms, then when the science evolves or things aren't the way we thought they were going to turn out, we really do lose the trust and confidence of people. So in a situation that is as fluid and as uncertain and as evolving as this one, it's really important to be humble, but really commit to learning 
and adopting and keeping people informed of how to expect that kind of evolution, but also keeping them informed of what's going on. So that while you, you will not lose people's trust by saying, I wish I had an answer to that, but right now today we don't, but here's what we do know and here's what we're doing to learn more as we go. And this is when I'll get back to you with an update. That builds trust, not promising things and then having to change our mind or change our direction. Wow, Julie, that is incredible wisdom that I feel like we need to get every leader in the world to hear. Um, for me, I think for me at LifeBank, what, what we've been able to learn uh, is uh, the power of technology and how technology can help us build that infrastructure, that soft infrastructure that will allow us to respond to medical emergency, to pandemics uh, and other uh, cr critical thing that the, that the public health in, uh, institution across our countries, particularly in the last mile, need to respond to how technology will play a huge part. And we're incredibly glad, glad to be at the forefront of building that technology stack that will allow us to solve problems rapidly. I love that, Tammy, because it's very disruptive. You know, you're leapfrogging into the future and in a sense, well, there's no silver lining to this pandemic. It does give you a little bit of a catalyst to get there faster. So thank you for what you're doing. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Wow, what an incredible conversation. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Julie, for the work we do at Merck and for just the leader, the wisdom that you have. Thank you, everyone, and over to you. Thank you.